Connor Hughes. Now, we're not going to talk about Connor and all his charities that he does today. We're going to talk about his dad, and everyone knows him, of course, and you, of course, uh, Danny. And I suppose, Connor, you look back now at your dad's life, and he lived life to the full, didn't he? Yeah, he had an extraordinary life. Um, and he, he had a great way of looking at life and I think that's what got him through even rough times he he never there's a few characteristics about my father uh, he never saw the bad in people he wasn't naive but he never saw the bad he'd look for the good he also he loved work because work brought him in contact with people and he very much enjoyed people so he had hard times uh, getting reared and so on working early and uh, he not nostalgically looks at, back on that as good times. He actually knew there were good times because he. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about him. Uh, wh- where did he live? Where was he born? And yeah. a little bit about him. He was born in Alma, and uh, they had a fruit shop, a quite forward-thinking fruit shop at the time. Uh, then they fell on bad times, and they moved to a meat that was kind of the lowest ebb of the family. Um, that's where he then came to the fore because at 14 he had to leave school to start rearing the family and that's where his initiative came uh, he would start buying and selling vegetables and hawking around Dundalk in particular that's where lots of people would have remembered him at the square or door to door and at that time it was only the one thing he was doing was was the vegetables at the very start yeah. uh, yes it was the vegetables then when he started gathering his business ability his horse and cart in the summer would be an ice cream cart. No, I'm sorry, a vegetable cart in the morning, transformed to an ice cream cart in the afternoon. And in the evening, then he played in the band. So he had these and three sticks. Was this all in Dundalk? This was all local, yeah, yeah. And um, like lots of people come in and remember him fondly for one of them criteria, you know, yeah. either the, the, the vegetables or the... The, the ice cream because they, they'd tell me about maybe uh, I'm trying to think of somebody yeah he used to shout ice cream a condenser the milk a because he always thought being slightly Italian would help business and um, I guess it's kind of it's not an urban myth but there was a time when he when he was cutting the ice cream um, he, he hadn't got his knife and he bought a knife and it was a two sided knife which he didn't realise and he cut his hand and he said, just as I was about to pack up with blood everywhere, one woman shouted to everybody, this man's got um, strawberry in his ice cream. And he says, I sold a lot. I hadn't an inch of blood in my body. I was white pale, but I was delighted with my sales. Karen McCardle. Now, people didn't know Karen, of course, the first thing they talk about it, chaplains. But that is not what we're going to talk about to Karen today. Karen, the name Melon has been part of your life for a long, long time. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how you got involved and at the very, very beginning and when was it? Well, in 2003, I was actually, even though we're not talking about hairdressing, I happened to be out in South Africa on uh, with the company called Wella on a hairdressing a seminar for want of a better words and when we were there and um, they took us around on tours of the city and while Cape Town is absolutely beautiful and um, the other side of Cape Town is the living conditions of its people and you can't help but notice the shacks when you're coming in from the airport There's, uh, and you can imagine coming out of Dublin airport and you when we take the turn for the you know M1 Belfast as far as those fields as far as the eye can see is just tin roofs of coronated shacks where up to a million people can live in this field with no sanitation no running water uh, not in, it might have public running water that they have to walk down the street the end of the street to get a bucket of water but not certainly in their own homes no flushing well, toilets did that have a, a big impact immediately on you when you saw it? Um, it did, and the longer you stay in Cape Town and you see the most amazing restaurants, the most amazing smiles of its people, um, five-star hotels, the bars, the wealth that's in Cape Town, and you see one side of the mountain, these mansions of houses, and the other side of the mountain, maybe a hundred tracks of where that mansion could be in the same square footage of that mansion is built. So it's it's very hard to sit there when you, and being wined and dined or whatever, knowing that these people that serving you are going home at night to that shack, and if the rains come, you know, or if it's windy, 
Um, you know yourself I've often come home in the winter and, and had run out of oil and you're cursing yourself because you, God love you you have run out of oil for one night these people don't have any heat you know? so when you were there and you were staying in a hotel yeah. or hairdressing conference or wherever and uh, you, ha- you couldn't get that out of your mind no and it was lucky that year that I, I didn't uh, come home on the hairdressing seminar I stayed on for a week's holidays and my mum and dad uh, Mary and Paddy McCardle flew out to join me and while we were there a local tour guide was t- asked me did we hear or asked all of us did we hear about this man ca- that they call locally the white god and we were like no at that stage 2003 there wasn't very much talk about Niall Mellon in not in, certainly in my in the hairdressing circles mm-hmm. and uh, she said she had she brought in a newspaper the next day and we were supposed to go on this tour you know whale and dolphin and she, it was very I thought it very poignant and when she brought in the local newspaper the next day it was called the Cape Argus and I was like this is a sign the Argus this is a sign <laughs> And then it was about this man called Niall Mellon that was going into a township called Imazama Yetu in Hout Bay and he was going to be building, bringing over some Irish building volunteers and he was going to be the first white man ever to go into a coloured township and in a week they had hoped to build 25 houses in the first in that week. And uh, so it, as it was on route to where we were supposed to go on the tour, we kindly told Arlene, forget about the tour, can we get into the, to, of the whales and dolphins? Today is Jean Yor. And uh, we are down to talk about the men's shed. But Jean, what is Dundalk's men's shed? Um, Dundalk men's shed was set up in 2011. Um, I think it was by Loud County Council and the Netwell Centre at Dundalk Institute of Technology. And... Um, up until two years ago, it was um, Loud Community Men's Shed, and it was it consisted of three sheds in the county: ourselves, Dundalk, uh, Cooley, and Drogheda. And then uh, we all became independent because um, the the funding that was there from, say, um, the EU funding that came and, uh, from, the, uh, from the EU and, and through Netwell, that all sort of dried up. And so we became an independent shed. And um, there's about, let me say, there's uh, about 500 sheds in the country altogether. So... Uh, we're part of a national organisation, the Irish Men's Shed um, Association. And are they all organised the same, Jean? Is, is the rules and regulations for every no, one of them the same, or, or can you do what you want? Each shed would have its own constitution, its own policy and procedure document, which I was heavily involved in uh, when we went independent. You know, we drew up our own independent um, policy. And that that was important. Um, the the manager of, of the shed when, when it was loud community men shed was um, Eva Byrne, and Eva is now with the national organisation, uh, the the Irish Men Shed Association, and um, the national body that looks after the interests of all the shed sheds around the country. So Eva did tremendous work here. You know, she she set it up uh, along with with others uh, you know, in Netwell Centre and. Kind of How long is it Center. here now in Dundalk? Two thousand and eleven. So it's here. Is that on its own, or was that part of? No, the as I explained, yeah. it started off right. as loud community right. um, sheds. There was three in two thousand and eleven. Two years ago, <clears throat> we all went independent because we no longer had funding coming through uh, the EU. So we're self-sufficient. The members, the, 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 there's a basic uh, fee that is paid, a very small fee. It's, it's uh, a membership fee and a small weekly contribution. And then some of the members here make items which we sell in a shop or which people ask us to make. And we have our Christmas uh, raffle fundraiser and an annual flag day, but that's basically it. So we have to um, we have to provide um, our make our own way. We have to have pay our own bills, uh, our own rent, and etc. You know, so we manage to take over. You know, and. Uh, Listen to the full interview on www.gatheringheritage.com.